I hate to tell you, that's what I saw. I was there for four days. I've got the notes. Um, they're conspiring to convince citizens that these systems are safe and secure. They're pushing voter registrations as much as possible. And they're even spent a fair amount of time talking about how to indoctrinate our children by teaching our elementary kids even, and high school kids, how to vote and getting them pre-registered to vote. There was actually a push to pre-register elementary kids and they gave, gave away prizes to secretaries of state who got the most kids pre-registered. It's disgusting what I saw behind the scenes and what's going on that no one knows about. So here is a Brazos, October 2nd, 2020. They plant the idea, so no one's surprised here. Record registrations, 120,000, right before the election. And then when asked, they say, well, I don't know. The county didn't understand. Well, what do you think's happening? Someone's manipulating the system. That's why the county didn't understand where it came from. Like, how, how much more do you need? So the tabulation is the next part. Go past the, the paper. Well, I'll talk about the paper poll books a little bit here. So the poll books are what you're checked in with when you vote. Now, back in the old days, you'd go in, they'd have a piece of paper or a notebook with all the names that are allowed to vote in that precinct. Nowadays, they have the electronic poll books. Okay, in Texas, 1.4% of the counties are using paper poll books. That's it. The rest of them are using these electronic poll books. And here's why the poll books matter. Again, you gotta think like a bad guy. What could a bad guy do with the electronic poll book? Well, if if that allows you to control who's allowed to vote, you could just create records in there and then tell people to go in under those fake names and then their name, they would know what name's in the database, right? So if you wanted someone to vote under Jim Storgensen, you could just throw Jim Storgensen into the database and then tell Bob to go in and claim that he's Jim Storgensen. When he goes in, he says, I'm Jim Storgensen. And they look it up and say, oh yeah, I see you here. And the election officials think it's legitimate because it's in the database. He's not cheating. Well, his name's here. <laughs> yeah, but I put it there earlier. This is how they can do it. It's so easy. And here's the other thing they can do. If you have a thousand ballots that have been scanned and you have a thousand ballots worth of votes and you looked at how many people checked in to vote, and there were only 500 people checked in to vote, would you say we have a problem? <laughs> right? Clearly someone must have stuffed in an extra 500 ballots. So if I was stuffing in extra ballots over here, I would need a way to also stuff in the check-ins over here. So if I stuffed in an extra 500 ballots, even digitally, I can back it up the paper later. I'll just wait till after the election and then you know, some pallets will show up with some extra ballots, so I'm not worried about that. Or uh, as the ballots are being driven from one, you know, that precinct location, a polling location to the county, it'll just pull around this corner and we'll, you know, slide a hand the, the 500 extra ballots, throw them in there, and no one will ever know. But if you could also add those in over here, then a thousand here checks up with a thousand here, right? That happened in Texas. Multiple counties, Dallas and Houston, at least. So here's what happened. Some judges in Dallas, sitting there with their poll books, and when someone comes in and gets checked in on a poll book, the poll book keeps track of the number of check-ins. So in the beginning of the day, they were all zeros. Someone comes in to check in on this poll book here, they were writing their name down in a notebook, which was really smart, separate set of books from the electronic poll book wrote the name down, and then they would check the person in the, on the poll book. So the first person that checked in, they'd have one name on the paper, and the poll book would say there's been one person checked in. Another person comes in, checks in on that same poll book, they've got two names written down, and the poll book has two check-ins, okay? And everyone was doing that on their poll books in that location. And throughout the day, they were making sure that those numbers always lined up all the way through, and they were proud that I've got 56 here and 56 here. Great. If the 45 minutes before the polls close, one of them looks down and her numbers are going up on her poll book by themselves. 
And she looks over and says, oh my gosh, look at this. And they all start looking at their poll books. The numbers are going up on all the poll books, but no one's checking in. Someone is injecting records into the electronic poll book system. And they're pulling their phones out and they're taking pictures and videos of this. I've seen it all. I've even seen the poll books themselves personally. A week after the election, they're still changing. Still certified the election. And still certified the election. Yep, <laughs> nothing to see here. Everything's fine. Now, all these judges in multiple precincts in multiple counties filled out affidavits and they brought it to the Secretary of State. Now, what a real Secretary of State would do was, okay, we have a massive problem. Everyone stop, full investigation, the FBI, the whole deal, pull all the surveillance. We need to figure out exactly what happened, bring in the cyber guys, figure out. Where did these numbers come from? How did they increase? Where's the database? The whole huge investigation should have been started right then. Instead, what they did is they went to the vendor and asked them how that happened. And the vendor said it was sinking. They were still sinking. There wasn't enough bandwidth. So they're just sinking. And, and so they put that on the web. Right. S Y N C, right? Syn synchronizing, okay? A week after the election, still synchronizing. So let's go back over this. The poll book keeps track of how many people <coughs> check in at that poll book, physical people. The number starts going up on it, but the people haven't checked in. So does that mean it's ahead of its synchronization? Is it waiting for the extra 500 people to come through? Is that how good the system is? It's predictive. It knows that another 500 people are gonna come through. Well, the election was over. So here's what happened. The reason they were able to see that, and it happened 45 minutes before the polls closed, God had a little play in this also. And there was a little time zone, uh, or daylight savings time issue. And so some of those were off by an hour as a result of it. And being off by an hour, I had a feeling what happened was they ran the code an hour before it was supposed to run. They expected all of it to run after the polls closed when no one was going to be looking at them. And instead, it accidentally ran beforehand on some of the systems. And that's why people were able to see it. Now, when they saw this happening, they scrambled and they unplugged them all, thinking that would stop them. They kept going up because they had batteries in them. And even worse, they're Microsoft Surface tablets inside a metal case, so you can't see what it is. It's just a Surface tablet running Windows. And they kept doing it. So then they ran over and they grabbed the wireless router and they unplugged that. And then the numbers stopped increasing. So what that tells me is someone was injecting those numbers in the master database that is not even, we find out, not even in Texas. They don't even store the electronic poll book database for Texas in Texas. They store in some other state controlled by a different company other than the county or the state. What could go wrong? I have a feeling there was electronic poll book manipulation on a probably massive scale throughout the country as well to make sure that the numbers in the reports matched all the injected votes in the system. And when you have complete full spectrum dominance of the election ecosystem, you can play with everything and make sure everything matches up. But you can't do it really well unless you're really, really good and they're not quite that good yet. So they need time to do it. So now we have early voting, yep, like voting month. And then you got time after an election also so they can fix everything to make sure everything matches up. By the time the little peons finally get to count their ballots, we'll make sure everything matches up so they can look like idiots. Just like Maricopa County. That's what happened in Maricopa County. They took forever, like a year, and they finally allowed the citizens access to the ballots to do an audit. And it got kicked down the road far enough that they were able to get all the reports to match almost, but they had to make sure that Biden got a few more votes, right? Just to rub it in faces, but be close enough. 
They couldn't be exact because no one would believe that. So it had to be a little bit off, but of course in their favor, right? Did you know that when they opened up one of the boxes in Maricopa County, the citizen auditors, that someone had defecated on the ballots and closed the lid? That they had to have a hazmat team come out? That is what they think of us. How dare you gum underneath my shoe little peons dare question your elections. Take this. That's where we're at. We have allowed them to create this system that we don't have control over visibility in. But we can fix it all. We can fix it all. So here's another Brazos County uh, interesting aspect. I was looking over some of this data. Um, take a look. This right here, the blue bar is the number of registered voters in this county from 1988 all the way to 2020. And you can see pretty even here. And then all of a sudden in 94, massive jump all the way up to 02. Was anyone here between 94 and 02? Do you know what caused this huge jump? Because that's not natural. It's not a steady growth. Well, it has. Not, not like that. It, right. This, this was odd. Right? That's, that's, look at the slope. Like we're like not actually going down a little bit here and then all of a sudden now we're shooting straight up. When was the big push to allow the, the university students? Student the student that registration? Was that about that frame. time? That was in that time frame. Okay, there we go. I knew there was going to be a reason for it. And that's, that's probably. Cool. I, I'm adamantly opposed to that. Yeah. Well, that was probably an avenue to manipulate. That was when they planted a seed to be able to start. They realized, hey, we've got an opportunity here because we have to get registrations in in order to manipulate the system. And then notice, even though they have this huge drive for registrations, notice the number of people that voted, which is this vote. here, mm -hmm. right. is actually decreasing yeah, slightly. So you have a massive registration, but you have a decline in the voting. So that's a whole bunch of people going out, I'm gonna register to vote. Oh, but I'm not gonna vote. Well, that's good. Yeah. Exactly. Shows up. Right. So you look at early voting, early voting just starts increasing also during this time. Then the registered voters flatlines. It's odd for a slope to change like that so abruptly. But that would explain it. So we get the students all registered, then we don't have much of an increase here. But if you look here, and the people that are voting, definitely an increase in the voting right here. And especially the early voting is really starting to climb. Huge amounts. In fact, almost double between here and here. And then look what happens here. In 16, something changes again. You have this huge skyrocket of registered voters. And you have a skyrocket of the amount that voted, not people that voted, entries in a database that voted. Important distinction. And look at early votes, same thing. Big differences there. I would say dive into those records. I think we'll find inorganic data in those databases. That's not natural. They can't give us a list Voters as opposed to Biden and running election So I've got voter lists for a number of years in Brazos County. Okay. And we've been trying over and over to get numbers that match the actual number of votes because there's also voting history the last time they voted. Are you saying the numbers don't match? Oh, no, no. Now, under numbers. what circumstances would the numbers not match? Well, yeah. you have suspense voters, some are always being withdrawn, and then some are always being added, and we can't get a list as of a specific date. I want a list of election date so I can see that the amount of people in the voting history equals the number of votes. But, but they won't well, give you the data, data, right? What well, is the big secret? Data, but it, never matches. it doesn't match. So what's the big secret and why doesn't data match? Well, they're coming to life. Right? If, if you manipulate things, clearly things aren't going to match. That is indication of manipulation. And there's probably a lot of people that don't even know what's going on that are just as confused as you but they're really close to it and there might be, some of them may be responsible for it, so they might be really scared 
because now they're responsible for something they had no idea was going wrong. Right. That means they, you know, kind of derelict in their duties. Part of the problem is the local people don't know the database. It's all done at the state. Of course, they, they don't have access to it. They are acquiring thing and they can't really manipulate the data to get there. Well, I want the database because I exactly. want the Exactly. So here's a solution for that. Your county should be managing their own voter registration database. Now, I don't care what, if the law says that they have to use the state system, that's fine. They can use the state system. Also, redundantly, manage the roles yourself in a separate place. Airplanes have redundant systems. So have a redundant voter registration system. You guys could have a huge push in this county to have a local voter registration system. It's a dual system, right? The state system and the county system. And you guys could have the county always cross-reference with the state system in everything you do. That wouldn't violate any laws, nor should it, and it's just providing some extra protection, and you might uncover some inconsistencies and in some funny business in the state system that's not happening in your closed county system. Don't open it. Yeah, it's got to be closed, but keep that separate system. You can run it locally and push a copy to the state, but instead we have the state run it and push a copy down. Right, and they may that might be required by law, so that's what I'm saying. If you just keep a duplicate set and keep that local only, then you don't have to cause any problem here at the state level. Now, ideally, yeah, I would like every county to say, no, thank you, state of Texas. We're good. We're going to handle our own registration. Now, you can't just do your own registration and not cross-reference with other counties and other states because you don't want multiple people voting in two counties and two states, and some people have two residences. And or they could, in the system, they could have two residences but not actually own them. You don't want that. So what should happen is we should have what, uh, what's called local but federated registration systems. And that means we have a local system that we cross-reference with data sets elsewhere. Not a local system that can be changed by outside parties, but a local system you still cross-reference with other counties and other states. And if everyone published their data in a unified format, then that should be available to people to do. So not only do you have your local system, but you also publish it in a unified format that everyone can access, fully transparent, and then everyone, the citizen, should be able to cross-reference that. We don't want to hire one organization that's going to cross-reference it for us. Don't worry, little heads, we'll take care of it for you. None of that BS. Here, we'll put it out because it actually belongs to you, and you guys can verify it all your life. Then the citizen organizations and groups can do it themselves. Because we have to have citizen oversight. Anything we do in our election system has to provide for 100% citizen oversight. Because again, these elections belong to us, not anyone else. So back to this here, and this is why this is important. This is talking about all these problems with mail-in ballots. Now, in this multi-million dollar system, we shouldn't be having inconsistencies in addresses and things with mail-in ballots. It's not a huge amount, 76 of them, they said. But if even one of them has a problem, you have to look at what caused that one to have a problem. And chances are, others could have that problem too. So if there are 76 problems, did that cause anyone to look deeper to see if that 76 is actually like 76,000? I don't know if anyone looked deeper. Sometimes people only look at the surface and then they're good. Like that uh, Dominion glitch that they said only affected one state or a couple counties, but didn't affect anyone else, so we didn't bother looking, even though multiple states run exactly the same software version. It, I gotta say, if a particular software version affected one state, it affected every other state that ran that same software version. That's how software works. So they say at the bottom here, they talk about, for, uh, for those expecting mail-in ballots, you can track it here. Has anyone used the mail-in ballot tracking system? Track your mail-in ballot. Why do you think we spent millions of dollars on it? Here it is, Texas ballot mail tracker. I've only talked to a few people that have actually used this system. Why do we have it if no one's using it? Because it's not for you. They didn't build it for you. They built it for them. But they had you pay for it. 
and they had to make you think it was for you because they couldn't say, hey, we want to build the system for us. So they conned us again. So here's what this system allows you to do. In the old days, to manipulate an election, if you got your hand on all the ballots before they went to the real person that counts them, or the people that count them, and you counted them yourself and you figured out how many votes you're short, you could just inject more ballots or fill in under votes or create overvotes in order to cancel out opponent or throw opponent's ballots out. There's a lot of different ways to manipulate old school type elections, right? Paper, hand count. You can manipulate that. If you get your hands on the stuff, you can manipulate it. The big problem is they let ballots come in after the end of the election, but they don't know how many votes you need. You know, how much well, you need. I'll get there. So yeah. that's, that's the old school way was to do that. And we don't have to do that anymore. Now we have higher tech. So now they can use the mail-in ballot tracking to know that you mailed your ballot back. And with how divisive they have tried to make everything, they don't want independence anymore. They want everyone polarized. They want Democrats here and Republicans over here. It's not just to divide us, to conquer us. It also has another side effect, another benefit. And that benefit is if people are polarized, you know how Democrats are going to vote and you know how Republicans are going to vote. And if you know that you mailed the ballot back, are you a Democrat or Republican? So they don't know. They don't know. So they don't like you at all. They got to polarize you harder. Okay. Who's been polarized? Who's a Republican? Raise your hand if you're a Republican. There we go. Do they know how you're going to vote? Of course. Right? So when they know you mailed the ballot back, they know how you voted. So they can build a model, an estimate of the election results. And then you have to say, well, don't worry about me because I don't go in and mail in. I, I don't mail in, I, I go in in person. Okay, you check in on the electronic poll book. So they have access to that database too because I hate to tell you that database is on the cloud, available to whoever pays to access it. So now they know that too when you walked in and they know your party affiliation. So they kind of know how you voted. And they probably have social media profile on you too. So they've got all this other data. I mean, tell me no, but okay, you say the word lawnmower and the next day Facebook's showing you ads for lawnmowers. Give me a break. They have all of it. They got everything, right? So they can blend all that together and they can create a very accurate model of the election before they count a single ballot. So they don't even need to count the ballots anymore. If they know what the election results are, and they know where the, what they want them to be, simple subtraction. And they know exactly what they need to manipulate. But in order to manipulate, they have to be able to somehow get ballots into the system. Well, we gave them mail-in ballots. We even gave them drop boxes. And Zuckerberg paid 500 million to make sure we had drop boxes all over the country. A path to inject mail-in ballots. But then you say, don't worry, we have checks in place. Well, we talked about the one minute of training with the signature verification. So that's not a valid check. So they've got an, a, an avenue to inject all these ballots now. But they can't inject more ballots than they have registered voters, right? Because that would have, we'd have over 100% voter participation. Well, in a lot of places, we did have over 100%, right? We also have a very, very high percentage that's not really believable. That's why. So in areas where they need to be able to inject a lot of ballots to counter the real ballots, because there's so many that are voting one way, they have to have headroom to do that. And if they don't have enough headroom, they end up with over 100% participation. So they've got to make more headroom. To make more headroom, they've got to get more people registered to vote. They don't want those people voting. They don't want it clean. They, they don't want it clean. They just want as many registered voters as possible. It's just a numbers game. Because they don't want over the 100% participation. So they want as many registrations as possible, no matter what. But they can't have more registrations than they have population. You can't have 4,000 people registered to vote in an area that only 3,000 people live. So what do you have to do? They've got to push up the population numbers, right? As much as possible. Remember these huge drives for census? Oh, yeah. They're hounding people, right? Remember the question 13, 12 something years ago where they tried to get off the census, are you a US citizen? Mm -hmm. yes. We didn't know why back then, 
So here you go. Here's the answer to your question. Because they want higher population numbers. They want everyone to fill that census so the population numbers are huge so they can move the registration numbers up and register as many people as possible staying under the total of the population and then that gives them all the room to cheat. But it also determines seats in Congress. Personally. It determines seats in Congress, it determines how much money counties, I mean, there's a lot of benefits to manipulating that number, absolutely. They check off a lot of stuff, yes. So, yes. So my Honduran, my Honduran neighbor that has two or three new men come through every week with a driver's license, is he registered to vote with a Texas driver's license? If you, have, if you get a Texas driver's license, you can fill out a checkbox that allows you to register to vote, yes. All you have to do is just check that box. And what happens is it goes through DPS. DPS automatically adds it, I think in most cases, to the county's registered voters, and it bypasses the county's checks and balances. And that is a massive problem. Not a, no county should allow a single registration in their system unless they actually vet the person themselves. Yes. I have been yes. to some counties like Gillespie actually calls the voters. If there's a phone number on the form, they actually call and reach out and make sure they contact them and at least talk to them, right? But that still doesn't confirm it enough. Um, we, there's, there shouldn't be two pathways to add people to the voter rolls. There should be one. You should show up in person at the county. That's what should happen. Now, we, we, there's deeper discussions we can have later of, okay, what is our short term solution given the existing environment we have here? What can we do to best protect ourselves with these constraints? And then there's a long term plan. What do we need to get to? And those are two different plans. And I am happy to work with anyone here that wants to work on that with this particular county. I'm happy to sit down with your county official and draw out here's where we're at, here's where we need to go. What can we do within these current confines, short term, and to get us to a long term plan to protect the county as best possible? So that driver's license is not checked with DPS at all? I don't know what they do there, but all I know is if we don't have a decentralized right. system, it, it can easily be manipulated because then you have a single point that can be attacked. You can print them out very fast. You got it. And if you, manip if you can get into that system, it's so far disconnected from the county, the county can't get into the DPS system. So the county is kind of lost. It's, you know, it's a, a taking of control Please from the know. local officials. Right, so we have to decentralize. We gotta put the power back in as far out as possible um, at, at the citizen level. So, so civics, mail-in ballot tracking, not for you, it's for them. Now, C civics is who created it, right down here. Who's civics? Well, here's civics. Technology and expertise to transform the public sector. These people aren't even hiding. They're telling you what they're doing. They handle grants, and this is a multi-billion dollar corporation, like $200 billion, I think $200 billion. Grants management, lease management, right-of-way management, transit, airport management, business services, community planning, elections management, environmental data management, ethics administration. <laughs> they wanna handle it all. And they make software that enables safe, secure, accessible, and transparent elections. Right. I think we should be in charge of that. Not this corporation that is trying, got their hands all over here. So here are the companies that count your vote. In the United States, ES and S, Dominion, Heart, Unison, Clear Ballot, Premier, Sequoia, and Microvote. This is on verifiedvoting.org, by the way. Great website, fantastic resource. Write that down. If you want to know what election systems are used where, even down to the county level, and you can download all this data also, which is really nice. Verifiedvoting.org is not my site, but a great, great resource. And there's Texas. You guys have 50-50 pretty much, ES and S and Heart. You guys are a heart here. 
And I'm going to uh, fast forward. We know that modems are in voting machines. They've told us they aren't. And then a few months later, they start removing modems from the mo voting machines. They told us they didn't have modems in the first place. If you haven't realized these people lie to us and lie to the officials <coughs> making these decisions, uh, you're not paying attention. We are all being lied to. Uh, I, all, I was the uh, lead forensic examiner on the Tina Peters case for Mesa County, Colorado. I got the first eyes on that image, in fact. Uh, I don't think we have time, unfortunately, but what I'll do is after everyone's done, if anyone actually wants to see how easy it is to flip votes on that system, I will show that to you. And this is a system used in like 40% of the country where anyone sitting in the front of it could just flip votes without leaving a trace in 40% of the country. And it's been doing that for at least since 2014.